Jesus freak here. <clears throat> now, everything I'm going to talk about in this video is specific to the New Testament. None of this applies to the Old Testament. So, keep that in mind. Now, the New Testament... is 27 books that were written between about 50 and 180. So this is a pretty short period of time in comparison with the Old Testament, which was written over, <clears throat> over a thousand years period. It was just 50 years. And it did take a little while for the text to stabilize. The um, canon, as we know it, I believe was um, finalized around the 320s or so. And early on, the, there was a lot of variation in the text. And at some point, it kind of crystallized into two forms. You have texts from before took those two forms, <laughs> and some people call these Alexandrian texts. I don't believe there's an Alexandrian text, but there's two other forms. There's the Western form, which you usually find in Latin, although there's Greek evidence for this as well. And there's the Eastern form. And yes, there's differences between them. The Textus Receptus is an example of a hybrid text. It has elements from both Western and Eastern texts. For example, the Western texts have Acts 8.37. The Eastern ones don't. But the Eastern ones have the doxology at the end of Matthew 6.13. Western ones don't. As such, you'll find that a lot of the um, Greek texts have to kind of fuse the two together to really be complete. The Textus Receptus is a hybrid. It is mostly of an Eastern variety, but there's Western elements in it too. So you can look at a Western text and say, wait a minute, there's some stuff missing. There is, in fact, some stuff you'll find is not in the Latin Vulgate. And it is in the Textus Receptus. And vice versa. There's a couple obvious uh, mutilations in the Vulgate text. And if you've noticed, the King James is not purely a translation of the Textus Receptus. Occasionally it uses the Vulgate, and as such it's even more of a mix of West and East. When I translated the New Testament myself, <clears throat> I mostly used um, Erasmus First and Third Edition. These are Latin translations. They have a Greek text next to them. <clears throat> Not every edition did. The third edition copy I had didn't. The first did. I have a copy now. The second doesn't. That uh, also has it. Um, so I had the first and third editions of Erasmus. And I had the Latin Vulgate. And occasionally I'd use the Vulgate rather than Erasmus. The texts aren't really that different. 
as we say, even if you use a skeptical text, the text is about 95% the same as what we had before. So we're really, you know, talking about a, out 5%. And if you're just comparing the Western and Eastern texts, it's less because there's a lot of places where these agree where your older texts don't because they're before everything was really finalized. And that's the thing. You see, these texts are wildly variant because, you know, everything hadn't really gotten into the state where there people recognized it as scripture. So you have these weird copies. And, it, you know, it was starting to become recognized as scripture when you had Sinaiticus written, when you had Vaticanus written, when you had Alexandrinus written. These are the three major, you know, manuscripts that everyone's talking about. And of course you notice it's almost always Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. You don't hear much about Alexandrinus because Alexandrinus destroys the narrative. You see, they like to say that the Byzantine text, the Eastern type, didn't appear until like the 7th, 8th, 9th century or later. But Alexandrinus is, I think, late 4th or early 5th century, and the Gospels are of the Eastern type. That's really inconvenient for the people who uh, try to push that myth. And what of Sinaiticus? Well, let's just say, you know, it was obviously a poorly written manuscript. When it was being used as Tinder, when, uh, what's his name, Constantine von Tischendorf, found it at that monastery in Greece or wherever Mount Athos is, it was being it was literally used for garbage because it's what it was. It was garbage. As for Vaticanus, people like to talk about it. It's this big discovery. Erasmus had X. He didn't have a copy of it. He had a friend. He could say, you know, oh, can you look this stuff up in Vaticanus for me? You know what? I don't think he used a single word from what he found out. He didn't trust it. <laughs> so why should we trust it? Now... Um, in my own translation, the balance between the Western and Eastern texts was a little bit different than the King James. But I balanced basically the same text. I used, like I said, I used Erasmus, and I used a little bit of the Vulgate. Something interesting to note is that, although... Like I said, the Textus Receptus is mostly based on Eastern texts. The Kama Jahanium comes from the West. A lot of, you know, doctrinally important stuff seems to have been lost in one or the other, but... They check each other, and this 5% difference <clears throat> Here's the thing. The Nestle Elan text originates from the work of skeptics. Firstly, heretics, you know. Westcott and Hort were basically Anglo-Catholics. and didn't have a very high view of scripture. 
And Nestle Elan, you know, it's worked on by scholars. It's worked by secularists. And it comes from academic. Academia is inherently skeptical about stuff. So you have a text that comes from academia. Of course it's going to be a skeptical text. What are we doing with a skeptical text as believers? We the faithful should be using a text edited by the faithful. We have a few of these. We have the Textus Receptus. We have Hodges Farstad, which is labeled M in the New King James footnotes. We have Robinson Pierpont. I think I still got a copy of that somewhere. And there's Antoniades, which is used in the Eastern churches. Which is also a hybrid, because despite being an Eastern text, it has the Kama Jahanian. You see, the skeptics go about this completely wrong. And we're kind of foolish to accept the work of academics from outside the faith. Whether it be, you know, Church of Rome is outside the faith too. I mean, to be fair, Erasmus was in the Church of Rome too, but... He was followed up by Theodore Beza and the King James translators. When they used the <clears throat> Textus Receptus, it was Beza's version. Beza was the successor to John Calvin. Whatever you might think of some of his alterations in some of his later editions, like Revelation 16.5 and he's explained why he did it. I trust Beza any day over Nestle and Lond. Now, I'm going to go back to Alexandrinus a bit. I like to mention this one because it's so inconvenient for the scholars, for the academics. You notice how a lot of people love to say, you know, the, oh, the, they'll just ignore something that's inconvenient to the narrative. Alexandrinus, for whatever issues it might have with the epistles, in the Gospels it completely wrecks the traditional academic narrative about the origin of the Eastern text. What else might they be very wrong about? Because they're skeptics. I'm not saying the Textus Receptus is perfect. I'm not saying Robinson Pierpont or Hodges Farstad is perfect. I'm almost likely to say, you know, oh, I'd like to see a translation adapted off of, of Antoniades' text. You know, someone maybe go look through it and see how it differs from what underlies the KJV.
any of those is going to be better than the critical text. It's not a critical text, it's a skeptical text. It's an academic, secular text. Well, that and the church are wrong. And both of them want to undermine your faith in the written word for different reasons. We don't have that kind of ulterior motive. We want you to have faith in the written word. And through faith in the written word, faith in the living word, which is Jesus Christ. The academics don't want you to have faith in anything. And the Church of Rome wants you to have faith in their tradition above the Word of God. Who are you going to trust? Jesus freak out. 